what bird has the most elaborate, the most complex, and the most beautiful song in the world? Kids, I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. I am the Magic the Gathering content creating equivalent of getting to visit the Channel Fireball head office and getting a bit flustered and fanboyish and not making a whole lot of sense. Uh, Masha, I wonder what's in the past you. I was going to get the Channel Fireball logo like, tattooed across my chest and be in the next video on the YouTube channel. I could like burst my chest open and be like, yeah, Channel Fireball. I'll cover the nipples, guidelines, and all that on, on, on social media. But like, women might like it, kind of like, sex sells, that sort of thing. So, so I wonder, what, what, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, it sounds great. Oh, yes, yes. Any idea who that was? No. So Faithless Lou and Dodge the Banhammer once again, and not so much a mention of it being watched either by Wizards of the Coast, which meant that Twitter accounts across the land cried out as one. In many ways, I get it. Phoenix and Dredge are pretty hot property right now, some of the best decks in the format, and they're underpinned by the looting engine that Faithless provides. I'm willing to give the format time to adjust, and also we have Modern Horizons on the, well, horizon. I still think Modern Horizons sounds like a soap opera, by the way. But Modern Horizons isn't due to land until May, which is two to three months away. I'm willing to think that we don't need to necessarily ban more cards, but instead introduce more cards to the format through new and interesting printings, reprints, and unbans. I just want to see how it pans out. And if the format continues to be a desperate shit show of a race towards the finish, maybe WotC will take action. Or maybe they'll let it burn in order to push people towards Arena. Anyway, whilst Faithless Looting remains unbanned, I might as well get some reps in with it and ride that train of topical discussion to those sweet, sweet YouTube views. So buckle in, burn is the word, let's try and put 9 to 12 power into play on turns 2 through 3 and feel guilty for doing so. Phoenix is undoubtedly the hottest new addition to the format from recent sets. Arc Lake Phoenix itself was a sleeper hit, comparable in some ways to Rabble Master of recent memory in the fact that it pre-ordered for fucking pennies, but now it sits at a respectable or somewhat frustrating $30 plus to buy. Holy shit, I've just checked the price uh, while recording the script, and the online price is $56. Oh, Modo. The funny thing is, everyone you speak to about it knew. They had more foresight than even the mighty LSV, who only gave it a 3.0 on his set review for Constructed. So LSV didn't see it as a multi format all-star, but your mate down the LGS did. Hmm. Your mate Trevor down at a local game store will get all you with tales of picking up his playset for a couple of bucks because he's always ahead of the curve. Trevor's also that kind of player that when told you are moderately ill, he is of course fucking dying. If you are hungry, he's actually malnourished. His pet deck has no bad matchups, and he only loses at pre-release to bomb rares and mana screw. Fuck you, Trev. But that's enough of the card itself and the early adoption by dickheads like Trevor. Let's look at the deck a bit closer. Come hither. Grand Prix Oakland, won by Phoenix. GP Portland, two copies in the top eight. But Death Shadow took down the GP at least. GPLA, well, I did coverage there if you didn't know. I interviewed the winner, handed over the trophy to them as part of the closing of the broadcast because I'm kind of a big fucking deal now. We are live here with our Grand Prix LA 2019 winner, Mike Burnett. Here is your trophy kind, sir. How do you feel today? That's uh, incredible, you know, I didn't uh, plan on winning this tournament at all, like it's just, I was really hoping for top four, but, um... You'd have to settle for winning then. Well, Michael Burnett took down a tournament with Phoenix, and there was another copy of Phoenix in the top eight. It's done pretty well at some Star City Games events too, but who cares about the results of those, right? That was a joke. That was a joke. The SCG results are also support the strength of the deck to the SCG regionals in Durham last weekend, seeing Phoenix take first place as well. Wait, so... Those are some pretty good results as of late. I mean, the metagame can adjust, of course, and Modern Horizons can bring us new things, but perhaps in the the interest of competitive diversity, Wizards should consider stepping in. I mean, they do care about competitive diversity, right? COMPETITIVE DIVERSITY! Knocked my hat off. Competitive diversity is why Twin was banned. 
You do care about competitive diversion, don't you, wizards? Splinter Twin did nothing wrong. Phoenix is an aggressive tempo deck of sorts that often plays out like a mad combo deck in the hands of anyone that isn't me. For today's showcase and discussion, I will be piloting Michael's winning list from Grand Prix LA. He's playing a host of cool new spells from the latest set, including Phoenix, two Crackling Drakes, and a pair of Terramanders, also known as Peter Parker, Scary Terry, and thanks to Autumn Burchett dominating the Pro Tour, I mean Mythic Championship recently, the poster child of trans rights in the Magic community. Fuck yes. The game plan of the deck is to kill your opponent by hitting them with a lot of power very quickly, although the deck does very well in pivoting into less aggressive roles, being able to play a tempo game not similar to Delver, especially with the post-board counter magic, or looking like some kind of weird bird-like cousin of Dredge or Hollow One at times as well. It can grind, it can control, it can be aggressive. Yeah, the deck's pretty good. I guess comparing the deck to Dredge and Hollow One? Wow. Modern really is fucked. The idea is to ditch birds, cast a lot of spells, and bring them back to play to hit your opponent. This is achieved through discard outlets like Lightning Axe and obviously Faithless Looting. Multiple spells are achieved through one mana cantrips, the free cantrip of Mana Morphos, which desperately needs a bloody reprint. Wizards, please! And free spells. That's right, everyone's favourite RD mistake, Phyrexian Mana, rears his ugly head once again as Gutshot comes back into the format as a fucking staple. And people are mainboarding fucking Surgical Extraction as it's both a free spell that plays into the game plan of the deck that's also good against the rest of the faithless looting decks in the format. Look, last time Gutshot was legal was during Eldrazi Winter. I will go as far as to say that when Gutshot is a good card in your format, something is very, very wrong. I literally can't make my mind up whether I should let modern self adjust or whether it needs to be changed. As I write this script and record it, I can't decide whether to run with the meme that everybody's fed up with modern because that gets clicks and people love that shit or to be a bit less sensationalist. Actually, fuck it. Relatable content, right? Let's shit on modern some more. Anecdotally, I've actually quite enjoyed modern lately. Um, so there's that, I guess. Visible Shrug. The fact that the deck is looking to cast so many spells so quickly means that it is the best Thing in the Ice deck Modern has ever seen. With Thing in the Ice, also affectionately known as TT, which yes, sounds like titties, being probably the best card in the deck in a number of matchups. It's big, it's kind of like Psychonic Rift, it's kind of fucking great. I love titties. There are variations on the deck, the number of surgicals you play main board, for example, whether you play Jace Forin's Prodigy, or Terramander, or Bedlam Reveler, or Astral Cornucopia. Okay, I made that last one up. My point is the list is being varied up, here and there, there are some flex spots that are being discussed in depth every time the deck takes on a tournament, which seems to be every fucking weekend. So let's smash the deck into a modern comp league with minimal practice. What could possibly go wrong? So I did decide to practice a little before jumping into the league in order to check if I am missing some fundamental understanding of the deck. What I realised is that I probably am missing some fundamental understanding of the deck and the sequencing involved, but I decided to record myself playing it anyway and upload it to YouTube for the viewing pleasure of hypercritical magic players everywhere so they can comment below tell me how fucking bad I am. Yes, I do hate myself. The first game goes badly where I essentially fart into the wind and do nothing apart from follow through a little bit. In game 2 I failed to stick a Blood Moon, which is a shame, and then I struggled to find a looting for a long, long fucking time, so I can't dump these birds in the trash where they belong. I hold off for a while, waiting for the correct time to pounce, and not firing off these manamorphoses I need to resurrect the birds with multiple spells when they are inevitably in the yard. In the meantime, we get to stick a TT, which although probably the best threat in our deck against a lot of decks, I think it might just be pretty terrible against the Snap Cast of Restoration Angel Jeskai deck. We go to protect TT from the path with the spell, having the spell pierce available to get their cryptic that we saw in game one, but instead they just cast a straight up negate, which we can't pierce at this later stage in the game. Pierce seems to set the deck up to fight early hate and play tempo, not counter magic in a drawn out control matchup. I think in the long game control is quite favoured. <laughs> They stick a Jace and we finally find our looting. We looting and it doesn't get countered. We find a third bird and ditch two of them. We morphose, find another faithless looting. We cast it and ditch our third bird. It is happening. Birds is the fucking word. I then decided to get cute as we have hit our third spell needed for the bird anyway, so I decided to bait them into getting value from our pierce whilst they are mainly tapped out by casting a crackling drake here in order to present lethal next turn. In response to the drake, they cast surgical extraction, which our pierce cannot stop due to an open three mana. Surgical targets our bird, sadness is placed on the stack. 
I paused to contemplate what went wrong, whether I should have held on to the Dispel to catch Surgical as it's the more obvious threat to the deck. Dispel seems to be a higher value card than, say, Pierce, for example. Casting the Drake wasn't wrong. They could have Surgical in response to the delayed trigger at the beginning of combat anyway. But, yeah, I think if we, if we take away all the memes and the jokes, Dispel is of such a high value that Surgical is so heavily played right now, so that we need to hold on to Dispel over the Pierce. I guess there's no way to be sure they ran Surgical over Rest in Peace. But I mean, Surgical demands this price tag because A, it hasn't been reprinted, and B, it's played a fucking lot. Sadness resolves our first ever round of Is It Bird Tribal, and we got Surgical fucking hard. I consider shame scooping, I don't. They path our Drake, and now we are pretty damn low on threats. I scoop it up. Okay, brush it off. That's just player league. What's the worst that could happen? Our opening hand looks fine, it's all cantrips and no threats, but we will draw half our deck anyway, and everything will be just rosy. We cast Faithless and find another Faithless and a land. We discard a land and a Mana Morphose as we have an abundance of spells. Unsure if this is correct, please tell me in the comment section below what you would have discarded here. Turn one in the blind. Tron land into star from them, this feels fine, as long as they don't just Tron into Karnas on turn three. We should get enough time to set up a strong board presence for a kill, as long as they spin their wheels a little bit. We draw a Drake, loot some more, ditching Lightning bolts, they seem pretty useless in this matchup to be honest. They untap, crack a star, make a green mana, play a land, and Sylvan Scrying for the third land needed. Oh, for fuck's sake. We draw a Phoenix to turn off, we've cast the second looting. I think I punt here by not looting out of the bin again, instead, casting Mana Morphose to try and hit a land drop to play the Drake next turn. This video this week, by the way, is going to be filled with a lot of uncertainty. I've been feeling pretty underconfident, I've been losing quite a bit on camera. I've started to win some more games off camera than I was before, so I'm not in the place I was a few weeks ago, but yeah, the, the CFB comments have been pretty harsh. I think got really shitty when I uploaded a slow play last week because there wasn't one of these videos. So yeah, sometimes your confidence gets knocked. But you know what, if you're just needlessly, needlessly critical and don't have any constructive feedback for me, fuck you. No lands, so we use the mana to cast Faithless Looting. We ditch a bird and a land, and then use Surgical as our third spell, hitting their self and scrying. We see their hand and feel pretty distraught at the sight of a fucking worm coil engine, but a bird and a drake might be able to race a worm coil. These drakes get really fucking big really fast. We slap them down to 17. They Tron. They Worm. They also play a map. We slap them and cast a Drake there on 14. They crack in, changing life totals to 20 on their side versus 12 on ours, which isn't great. They tap for a lot of fucking mana, and I think it's going to be an Ugin. This is 5p Terror 2, but in fact, it's just a walking ballista for 4 that kills our Drake in terms of the ability to race this big fucking worm spiral and machine, and I guess that's kind of as bad as an Ugin in the fact that it means we've probably lost. We chart a course, hit a land and cantrip, and then we opt and find a gut shot. I realise that I am unsure what it is I'm even trying to find at this point. I top it in the vain hope that we find a lightning axe to allow us to kill the worm coil engine or some such bullshit. It's a bad line, I know, but we have little else in all honesty at this point. The Ancient Stones with a cool alternative cat art card art card card cat card card. That's really hard to say. The Ancient Stones with the cool cat art find and cast Khan. That's a lot of k k k k k k sounds in that sentence. You could add cunt on the end of it as well if you wanted to. We've seen enough of this big Tron energy and we scoop it up. In game two, we get to cut all our shitty removal spells in favor of bringing in some artifact hate and some blood moons. Blood moon doesn't win the game against Tron. It's not a true Tron killer, but it does slow them down enough for us to execute our game plan of slapping them to fucking death with birds and tits. Tits and birds. I love birds and tits. We leave with a turn one flying man. Tron lands sphere from our opponent. We attack for one, draw two cards off a charter course, and feel that this might go our way. They play the mine, so they're just one land off natural tronning us for fuck's sake. We blood moon them, stop the natural tron bad beat story, and they natural state us in end step off of the green mana from the sphere. They untap and they natural fucking tron us, but fail to play a back breaking haymaker. Huh. Instead, they opt to play Oblivion Stone, which is which is quite good for us. We loot, find the two lands, and ditch them. We are looking for Shattering Spree to get this O-Stone and ride our little Peter to victory. We thought scan to see if we can find some birds. No birds. We cast Manimal Foes, find no bird and no spree. We opt and find an Abrade on top of our library that we don't have the mana to cast anymore because we're on our mana to cantrip to find it. Fucking sadness. We bolt them with our spare red mana because the bolt won't do much else in this matchup and attack. On the upside, Peter, which is kind of like a bird 
five, but not, will adapt into a five five and force them to, to pop the stone, allowing us to follow up with another threat. Then they play Ugin. Ugin bolts the Terramander and we are in a bad spot. We draw a thing in the ice, cast some cantrips to try and dig for some birds and fail to find any, instead finding a pierce that would have been fucking great against a walker haymaker, but alas, we got so fucked it should probably be uploaded to Pornhub. Well, shit. Guess we got fucked? Cantrips and a bolt, what could possibly go wrong? Our opponent leads Glade, cover Scout, the honorary Bogle, or Bogle, 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 whatever. Which means our bolts are bad here. Thing in the Ice is our trump card, if we can find one in time. We cantrip into Surgical and a fucking gut shot to hold. We can trip into surgicals and a fucking gut shot to add insult to injury. They begin to apply copious amounts of magical pantaloons to the elf, an ethereal armor and a rancor, and I get punched in the gullet for a considerable amount of damage. We dig deeper and find nothing but the majority of our 18 fucking lands. Two more rancors slap us for approximately a million damage. We get one more turn at four life, but nothing comes of it. We have a one lander with a spell pierce, cantrips, and a thing in the ice. Through the power of Faith's looting, this is a snap keep. We loot, find another land, and ditch the bird and the drake. We draw one of the few bolts left in our deck after we sideboard the rest of them out. It's because we don't have enough better options to put in, but it still goes to face and cancels the spell cast for the birds anyway. TT sticks and their boggling gets its first fashion accessory. This year's hottest vintage aura, Rancor. Their second land is a dried arbor, which is absolutely fantastic for us. I can trip, desperate to find another land, and we fail. We bolt the bird, kinda, and pass back. Another Rancor and a spider umbra takes us down to 10 life. I can trip a bunch, bounce their boggle, the rancors go back to their hand, uh, but they lose the spider pants forever. Bird comes back and we slap them down to four. <gasps> they boggle playing out another spider umbra and get ready to block. Boglin survives going under the bus here because of the spider umbra trigger, they are on one life. We chart a course in order to dig for that last copy of bolt but don't find anything but lands. Jesus wept, I'm really good at drawing lands in this deck. They cast one of the rancors we know about and scoop it up. We have a very slow hand that does almost nothing so we ditch it for a six. Our six is a thing, anger and cantrips. It's a pretty solid six to be honest. We square a drake to the bottom of the library and they lead with dried arbor on a mole to five which makes our anger of the gods look very, very good. We loot to ensure we can hit land drops and discard a tarn and a charter course valuing land drops, anger and this spell piece a lot higher than the chart itself. They play a boggle and give him some fashionable shoulder pads in the form of ethereal armor. We could tap out for Thing in the Ice here, but I am too scared of getting one over because we have a zero cantrips in hand to actually flip the fucking thing. Instead, I want to make anger as powerful as possible, so we pass back and tend to pierce a second aura, or ideally, a coronet. They cast Daybreak Coronet, and we get to pierce it so fucking hard. Oh, that feels good. We take three damage, untap, and we anger the gods they're bored away like a wet wipe upon the mouth of a dribbling baby. Take that, boggles, you shit. They play a dampling spirit, which is fine by us. We play a thing in the ice and a tap land and look to cantrip in their turn, but then I just forget to do it. Yeah, that, that was a punt. We phoenix them for three, and they get to resolve a spirit mantle. This is very good at helping block a flip to TT, but not if deployed before the TT flips. We cast a load of spells and sculpt our hand to look exactly Exactly as it did before. They play a second Daybreak Coronet and it sticks. They attack, moving life totals considerably. They're on 15, and we're on 8. We gut shot an end step to be mana efficient. Untap and Thought Scour allows us to flip our thing and bounce that big old dude and waste all the ores on it. We can't cast our bird here because of the sphere, so we slap them for 10 with a thing and a bolt, taking them to 4. Our opponent doesn't bother to replay the boggle again and concedes. GG get thinged boggles. Did you know original Innistrad and its successor had many references to famous and influential pieces of horror fiction? Delver of Secrets famously draws allusions to both Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis and the famous short story The Fly by George Langelin, or perhaps more famously the film adaptations of this story, including a Vincent Price version of the film and the absolutely wicked David Cronenberg body horror movie from the 80s. If you haven't seen it, you really fucking should. Amongst the many allusions found in Shadows of Innistrad, Thing in the Ice is probably one of my favourites as it draws direct reference to the name of the, the Thing from another world. 
world, or perhaps more well known the John Carpenter remake of the movie from 1982, in which explorers and scientists find a creature from another world trapped within a huge block of ice. In those stories, the creature breaks free and imitates members of the expedition crew, bringing an element of like, psychological horror and paranoia to the proceedings. This is kind of where the similarities and references end, as the inner Strade influenced horror is more in line with the huge sea creatures and krakens of magic history, bouncing things, presenting a huge physical body to twat your opponent with instead. Either way, I just want to mention it as The Thing and The Fly are both incredible movies that people need to see. If you haven't seen them and you're okay with gross out horror, you probably need to see those movies. In some ways, it's a shame I can't make more The Thing references as I play TT in the following rounds, but I guess joking about tits is funnier. <laughs> men have just discovered something. For 100,000 years, it was buried in the snow and ice. Oh look, it's the thing, and some cantrips. Rushland into ancient stirrings makes you think this is Tron, but they find a windswept heath, so it's the old Bantel Drazi list, I guess. We stick a TT and they cast my beloved Thalia and I feel a little betrayed. This makes my hand so fucking clunky too. God damn you, Thalia. We cantrip and play a Terramander, Noble Hyrock into Basilisk Collar, right? Okay, it does look just like an old Bant and Hadrazi list to me. I loot, find a land drop, discard a cantrip, and TT. We keep up Bolt, plan to waste our opponent's mana next turn when they equip the collar inevitably to Thalia. Success! Got them! Then they play a second Thalia. Great. I cast a looting and bounce their board. I slap them for a bunch and replay Peter Parker. Two mana dorks from them. I cast Faithless Looting, discarding our freshly drawn bird in the mountain. We cast a chart the course, trying desperately to find one more land to bolt with. We did it. Play the land, bolt their bird, and resurrect our bird, and we swing. They force the chump and go to five. They take a draw and scoop it up. In game two, we lead Peter. They play Rest in Peace, which is frustrating, but not the end of the world. We resolve Thing in the Ice and get in for one damage. TKS comes down off in our Drazi Temple, and they exile our Crackling Drake from hand which seems very correct in terms of the choice they made. We loot, we cast Thought Scourer and we attack for one. Big fucking plays, boys! They attack with an exalted TKS and then they part our thing in the ice. This isn't looking great to be completely open and honest about things. We play our second TT because good TTs always come in pairs. We more foes than we abray their noble. We slap them for one in the air, the race is on and we are losing it. They play and equip Sword of Fire and Ice, and I feel really miserable about this. It's probably one of my favorite cards in Magic, if not my favorite card in Magic, but maybe we can, maybe we can, maybe we can still race this if we draw enough cantrips, maybe? They attack us, shoot our face, and we draw a land. GG Sophie. In game three, we will not spunk off on a braid so early if we can help it. We have cantrips, a land, two bolts, and an honorary bird in the form of Drake. This seems fine. Stirrings finds them at Drowsy Temple. We can trip a bunch and see a Chandra. I consider putting her on the bottom of the library as land drops are vital, but I am a sucker for that planeswalker and I top her. Probably mistakenly. Let me know what you think. Turn two sphere from them, turn three thing from us missing a land drop. Oh, shit. They play a Thalia, almost guaranteeing we will only be able to cast one spell a turn for the rest of this fucking game unless we can bolt her pronto. I decide to favor looting in order to look for lands. We see none. I discard the Drake and keep Chandra in hand. Thought not, Shia takes our Serum Visions as they can see that we are strangled on lands and don't want us to make land drops. We draw a third land and bolt the Thalia and can't cast Peter due to the Sphere. We can Thought Scar in their turn, though. However, they play a second Thalia, which I let resolve without thinking, and thus I can't cast the Scour. Fucking hell, magic is hard. I played the Terramander and I just hope they don't realize we can adapt it. What looks like a flunge from our opponent where you attack with everything without thinking, we adapt and they path in response. Oh shit. We go to eight after blocks. We have an immense amount of options here now that we've hit five mana on our turn, but I decide to slam the walker as early as possible. If they have no paths, we are golden. So it feels like a perfectly fine option here. We down tick Chandra and kill the Thought Not Seer and draw a card. They play a reality smasher and smash us to three, ignoring Chandra. This feels like a bad spot for sure. We use Chandra's card advantage mode, ticking her up. We see Arclight Phoenix, and I can't realistically cast that here as it means I would be on block duty with both creatures just not die next turn. I regret my decisions that led to me to this point. This game is really getting away from me. We bolt the Thalia and then flip our TT in combat to bounce the Smasher. They play a fucking Displacer. Oh boy, this is bad. This is real bad. They flicker our TT before damage on our turn, so we need to get it to a stage where we can flip it again and just hope they fail to blink it in response to the last trigger just to stay alive. The plan sounds bad, but as I've said before, 
That's all we've got. We get up there with Faithless looting out of the bin and another handful of spells, and they just blink it in response to the flip trigger on their turn, and it never bounces their stuff. Fun fact, TT has a trigger to flip, and then a trigger to bounce off separately once flipped. If it is removed, bounced, flickered, any of that jazz, whilst the trigger to flip it was on the stack, we don't get to bounce shit. Oh, it's a bit... Yeah, that, that washed the salt away. <laughs> Before we get into round four, a quick message from our sponsors. Today's video and all content on my channel is brought to you by the wonderful channelfirewall.com, your number one source for magic, strategy, and singles. Channelfirewall.com has some of the greatest names in magic and me making content for them so be sure to sub to their youtube channel and head over to channelfirewall.com to check out their store which has a great comprehensive selection of magic singles and products you can also directly support the channel and my day-to-day -day living by using the code kenobi when signing up to any gp or magic fest the code doesn't offer you anything in particular there's no discount i'm afraid but it tells cfb where you came from and that i'm your favorite beardy magic boy all my content is also supported by the kind and loving people putting into my patreon which allows me to do this as a full-time gig and write six thousand word scripts and edit them up each week the people on screen now are the biggest contributors to my patron they are my splices they hang out in calls each week and let me sound off ideas and chat shit with them if you want to get involved with the patreon you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash pleasant kenobi for just two dollars a month you can get involved in the memes and the banter over the discord and get behind the scenes looks at how tired i am or tilted i am at a certain matchup we talk about food we talk about how americans don't know what hot dogs are come hang out and get involved support me directly if you like what i'm doing here with the content. We keep this assortment of cards, it seems fine, needs a looting to be really good, but then what doesn't really? We can trip, but then we have our thing snared. Ooh. Our second one resolves though, got him. We also draw a looting, which makes us probably better, lucky, than good. We ditch the bird and we gut shot them across the brow like a warning shot. And then we surgical their spell snare. Unlikely they play more than one, but we also get to look at their hand too. We see Snapcaster, Bolt, Teferi, and some lands. Interesting. Bird goes to get in but gets bolted like some elaborate fog. We flip TT with a looting and they just use this chance to get a free flashback of their Snappy to bolt our face. Snappy goes back to hand. We slap them to 11. Teferi comes down and tucks our TT in like the low hanging, drooping wabs that they are. We cast and haste a freshly drawn bird right into Teferi, killing it. Get the fuck out of here, you slag. They make a land drop and pass back. We metamorphose, play a drake, and attack for three, taking them to eight. This presents lethal. They snapcaster and cast hieroglyphics on end step. They attack us for two, then bolt plus lightning helix our poor drake to gain some life. What did he ever do to you, you fucking monster? We double cantrip and bolt them to return a bird, then we slap them to two. Detention Sphere does a good job of getting rid of both of our birds for good really because we have no way of bouncing that but all we need now is a bolt we play a thing and chart a course don't find it we get hit for six going to five life this is squeaky bum territory as this is a close matchup we opt find bolt draw it cast it wait hold headshot got there in game two we keep this uh, um I think it's good. We are one, one mana or three spell off of making a bird from our yard on turn three to start swinging. That's something, I guess. So awkwardly, we loot for three mana, finding a chart the cause and a Piet Parker. End of turn three, they helix our face, perhaps aiming to get their life to as high as possible and utilize their mana as efficiently as possible. Next turn, we resolve Peter and they attempt to snap cast a helix it, which we dispel. They attack for two. We cast Thought Scour and opt in their end step to enable Peter next turn, but this opens up the window for them to helix Peter again. We hit a fifth land, cast Chandra, tick up for mana and stick a TT. They bounce and draw with Cryptic. They kill Chandra with a Helix plus Snapcaster attack. That felt pretty brutal and they are now on 28 life. We untap, cast a thing. We cast Looting, discard a land and a bird, Morphose, Morphose, find a second thing, cast it, then surgical away our opponent's helixes as we know we're bouncing their snappy this turn. We slap them to 22 with two birds, and we make note that Anger of the Gods is in hand. Some might say that this is a particularly good turn of events. Anger kills our birds, we untap, looting out of the bin, draw Peter, play him, and slap for seven with TT. That's the sound of me doing a slap noise for the video. I hope you enjoyed. Before allowing them to untap, I adapt Peter. They cryptic tap our team, 
this is the game we're going to play now, I think. They go to Snapcaster Cryptic Guard team again, but I opt to flip my second TT now before it allows them to reuse the Snapcaster for another fucking Cryptic. They decide to Cryptic bounce their Snapcaster and attack my team, bringing Snapcaster back to hand. Clever. We replay the Terramander after combat and adapt them. We Serum Visions and see a Surgical, which was a shame that it's so fucking late, because that would have been Ace a turn or two ago. With Surgical on top of our library, we get Snappy Cryptid again. They play a Teferi and opt to draw a card. We pretend to tap mana in their end step and try and make them think that we have some sort of instant speed interaction, because why the fuck not, right? They animate a Colonnade and go to blocks. I realize that after blocks are declared, Bolting the Snappy would have won the game right there and then, but they had a full group of four cards, so I suspect counter magic, so perhaps playing cards in my hand isn't a good idea if we don't have to. They draw one more card after Fairy and they scoop it up. We got there. We have a triple bolt plus TT hand. This must be good, right? Our opponent turn one suspends a search for tomorrow, so this is almost certainly some form of scape shift. We stick a thing in the ice. They play a tap, Valakut, and pass. Turn three, we manamorphose, opt, and thought scour, bolt their face, and slap them with a flipped thing in the ice, and take them to ten life. Feels good. They get to four mana on their turn three, but we never let them have a turn four by slapping them again and bolting them again. Thing in the ice is fucking legit. In game two, they start by suspending another search for tomorrow, and we draw Blood Moon in our opening turn. We lead with looting into discarding two birds. Things are looking very, very good. They play a tap, volcano, and pass. We cast a looting, desperately looking for a freak spell for some kind to be able to animate these birds. We find a land and an opt. An opt finds a TT. We want the TT, but topping it means we don't get the free spell for the turn. I risk it for the biscuit. I bottom it. I find another fucking Drake, which is fine in the long run, but a bit disappointing. Search grabs them another basic forest, and they cast a Relic of Progenitus and exile our birds. Sad. But fine. We draw a thing in the ice so we can't cast a drake here, we need another untapped land. So we instead slam a moon just to get it out there and ready. Colony Heart Expedition from our opponent, we draw a Spire Bluffs and suddenly realise that without Man or Foes or another basic island, we're going to struggle real fucking hard to cast these drakes. Looking at those mana costs. <laughs> It's okay, we have a thing on the ice. They cast a relic, make a land drop, we untap, and we cast opt to dig for an island. We find Man of Foes, which is likely a temporary island for us. I don't cast it here, instead looking to use it next turn to cast a drake. Farsic and secure type of speed bump from our opponent. We need to be wary of just dying to a string of 6-6 six, six trampling giants from our scapeshoot opponent, if they can't combo kill us now because of Blood Moon. We draw a surgical, which is cool, because it's a free spell to help flip TT on demand eventually, and we cast Man of Foes to make the mana for Phoenix. We draw a second search call for Drake, which is nice as now we can defo, defo, defo flip TT on demand if we need to. I can't decide which art I like more here because they are both so fucking good. We surgical them to take a look at their hand and we see Pact and two Primeval Titans so the prime time is coming. They play a Titan and I flip my TT in my turn with a lootings, forgetting that it would bounce my own Drake as well. Derp. We slam in for 7, taking them to 12. They replay Prime Time and play a Damping Sphere 2. I Thought Scour and end up with two bolts in hand. I swing. They do not block as this would lose them their Titan. They go to 6. I bolt them. Then I bolt them again. And they are dead. We got there. Ultimately, the deck seems super powerful. That much is obvious. With a good amount of practice and knowing what hands are best and ties are sequencing, I can see why this is able to take down so many events. It's fast, it can grind, but it has access to the tools to play a control game in and around Thing on the Ice post-board to give it a game against almost anything trying to create a board presence at all. Thing on the Ice, although not a bird, I mean it doesn't even have wings, so it's even arguably not, a, not an honourable word, it's probably the best card in Is It Bird Tribal. For sure. I hope you've enjoyed this week's video. It's been a long one. I'm pretty hyped to see what the reaction to this is. I don't play tier decks all the time, by the way. There will be some brews coming over the following months. I'm still considering going to Niagara Falls Magic Fest, so I might do some legacy leading up to that regardless of whether I go or not. I really need to weigh up not only cost, but time. It takes time to fly to America, for example. If you liked the video, please hit the like button and comment below with your favourite bit or any of the points where I wasn't sure on sequencing and play, let me know what you think. If there's something you want to see in future from me, let me know in the comment section below. There's a link to my Patreon in the description as well. If you want to throw a couple of bucks my way to join my Discord, become part of the community and help support the channel, it allows me to uh, get more equipment and just support my day-to-day -day living to make lots of content. It's a small cost for big upside and all that. I've been Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. I will see you all very, very soon. Ta-ta for now.